Okay, if you have your Bible, you can turn to John chapter 2. We've made it all the way to, all the way to John chapter 2. We're going to be covering verses uh, 13 through 24, somewhere in there. Just a recap thus far of where we've been. Uh, thus far the series, we have discovered the key to John's intended purpose, right? So John has told us what his purpose is. And that's really found in chapter 20, around verses 30 or 31. And in that chapter, what he tells us is this. I have included these signs in this book so that you might believe, so that you and I might see the signs, bear witness with John to these, what Jesus has done, and the signs, the symbols, and the sayings of Jesus. And he says, so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, God's King, God's anointed King, and God's one true son from eternity, God's one unique son. And when we do that, we believe. And when we believe, what happens? We receive eternal life and abundant life. Now, the key to that really is in John chapter 2. John chapter 2, we covered last week, Pastor Patrick covered the wedding of Cana. And the wedding of Cana, according to John, was the first sign. And it is through that sign that Jesus began to display the glory of God, his glory to his disciples, and when the disciples saw his glory revealed in his works, they believed. You see, you can know every passage in scripture. You can know every single one of these stories by heart. You can know them all. But if you guys, if we don't see the glory of God revealed in it, and our heart is not warm to it, we won't believe it. We will know it, but we won't believe it and trust it. And that's what he wants us to do for eternal life. So what is the glory of God? When we talk about that, we have to understand kind of what the New Testament is talking about relative to the glory of God. The glory of God is God's dwelling, tabernacling presence. It is God's presence dwelling in our midst, manifest in sacred space. So it is all the way back to the garden. This garden, beautiful, lush garden sanctuary, God manifests his presence. And there are some image bearers there, some people who live in that garden. They live in that sanctuary, and they are consciously aware of God's revealed presence. And that's, when you have that, you have a sanctuary. You have an image bearer, you have God revealing himself in the midst. And so we have the garden, and then we have the tabernacle, in the Jewish system, a sort of mobile church there, you know, they set it up and tear it down as they move along. So you have the tabernacle, and eventually that is superseded by the temple. And the temple is a stone, semi-permanent stone building in Zion, in Jerusalem, where uh, that the, uh, all of the imagery that's bound up in the tabernacle is now fulfilled in the temple. Now we come to this passage, and we are going to learn this main thought. Here's what we learn is that the story confronts false and corrupt worship. So Jesus is there in the temple complex. He is going to confront false and corrupt worship. And simultaneously, he's going to reveal to us that this Jewish temple where bloody sacrifices were made for men is now superseded by the new temple and a new and better sacrifice. So Christ is the new temple. And his sacrifice is the new and final sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Now, the story is very interesting because in the, go- in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, those Gospels are what we, call, what we call synoptic Gospels. And a synoptic Gospel is just three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that sort of see the story along the same uh, chronological contours. But John's Gospel is not synoptic. It's theological. And so John, as you recall, we said John was a memoir. And what you do with a memoir is you arrange the stories according to your theme. That's what John is doing. And so now most of the time when you come across a story uh, that, is, that is told in the synoptics, that is only mentioned in the Gospel of John, John assumes you already know that story. So the baptism, all that stuff about John and Jesus' baptism, he assumes, he mentions it, but he doesn't tell it. And he doesn't tell it because it's already in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is a reversal of that. This story is mentioned in the other Gospels, but it's told in this one. And so in the other Gospels at Jesus' trial, some people are brought forward and, and they say, hey, this man said that he would tear down the temple. 
that he was going to destroy Moses' temple. So everything was taken out of context. They didn't really say what Jesus said. And John is going to set the record straight. John is going to say, nope, I was there. Here's how the story went down. This is what Jesus really said, and this is why. So that's why we have this story. So we're going to pick it up in verse 13. It says, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves. And the money changers is uh, seated at the tables, uh, making a whip of cords, okay, so it's on, like Donkey Kong. Here we go. He drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. And he also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And the Jews then said to him, what, what sign can you show us that you have the authority to do these kinds of things? And Jesus answered him, okay, I'll give you one. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Critical. And after he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. One, Jesus confronted corrupt religion. Jesus was there to confront, clearly in the text, what Jesus is doing is confronting a religion, good religion, that has gone bad. And it went bad for a variety of reasons. Now, what you need to know is every time in this gospel, John depicts Jesus or portrays Jesus in the temple, it's usually a conflict. I mean, it's almost always a conflict. Jesus is uh, in conflict with the religious leaders. And it starts out this way, actually. The gospel starts out this way. So there's some phrases here we need to unpack to understand the background. The first one is, Jesus went up. To Jerusalem. How do you get to Jerusalem? Well, if you start in Galilee, you're going to climb almost 4,000 feet on your walk there. (laughs) So you're going to walk about 3,300 to 4,000 feet, somewhere in there, and you're going to have lots of hills and valleys in between, and it's a long, arduous walk. If you walk the Jericho Road from Jericho, it's a 14-mile journey. It's 3,300 miles, and when you get to the top of the Mount of Olives, that's the highest point in the journey, you look down on the Kidron Valley, and there, the next hill is the temple. That's why God calls it the temple on his holy mount. You and I would laugh at that. That's not a mount. That's, what are you talking about? You want to see some mounts? We can have some. So when he's talking about going up to Jerusalem, he's talking about making this long, windy, arduous journey. There are places in that Jericho road, there are places in that road next to the wadi where the disciples, in order to follow him to Jerusalem, would literally have to walk right behind him in single file. That's how narrow the road is compared to the wide Greek road on the other side of town. And so that's what it means. He's going there to celebrate the Jewish Passover. So we remember this from Leviticus. God institutes the festival, one of three major ones. He institutes that festival in Leviticus, but it goes back to Exodus 12. And this scene of a bloody sacrifice. And this bloody sacrifice that is actually eaten by the people. And then the blood of this thing put on the doorpost of the house so that God's angel of death will pass over the Jew and kill the Egyptian kind of a, just a wow kind of a story. So this is the festival that commemorates God's deliverance of the people back then. And then you have the temple courts. So unlike the first temple with Solomon, this temple is is interesting because it's the second temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. This is the second one built by Zerubbabel. So in, and it was renovated by Herod for 46 years. And he just overlaid it in gold. It was just, it was gleaming in the sun and you could see it from miles away when you were approaching the city. And so, and so the temple complex, the temple courts are very interesting because what the Jews had done in this day is they had created all these partition walls to partition off the courts. So if you were a female, you had to be in the female court and you could not go into the male Jewish court. If you were a Gentile, you had to be on the very outside What's, what was called the Gentile court, and Solomon's temple didn't have those. They had the courts, but they didn't have these partition walls, right? 
And then you have merchants selling. And they're selling all of the animals used in the sacrificial system of the Jews. The cattle, the sheep, the doves. And these were the animals bought by out-of-towners. Now what happened was, during the festival season, the uh, population of Jerusalem would swell several hundred thousand people. So now imagine this. You're in a city... Normally you live there. Let's say you're a Jew. You live in Jerusalem. And now it is so full of -of out-of-towners who are there. And it's big business for the local merchants. Big business for them. So now every home, every end, every extra room is rented out. And so the, the, the feast is on. And the merchants are there to transact Jewish religion. That's what they're there for. Then you have the money changers. Well, they're very important. They're authorized dealers who were required by rabbinic law to take this week off. Not from work, but to do their work pro bono. They were required during festival season by rabbinic law not to charge anyone for exchanging money. You see, these out-of-towners, these Jews or Gentiles who were believers in Yahweh, God's, uh, the one true God of Israel, they would come to this city and they would have all kinds of Roman coinage. And they would have to exchange it because in the temple you couldn't spend pagan coinage. You had to have the half shekel which was considered a pure shekel or a pure form of money. So they get there and you have to have these money exchangers there. These are the bankers. So they're very important. They're very, very integral. So what's the problem? That's the background. What's the problem? Well, Mark fills the story out for us a little bit. In Mark chapter 11, verse 16, Jesus cries out, you have made my temple, my house, a den of robbers. And in 2.15 in John, he says, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And so Jesus sees three things, I think, going on here. And he's seen them since he was a little boy. And he has always, have you ever wanted to quit a job? Like, have you ever fantasized about quitting a job and walking around and just telling everybody off and then just storming out? Well, this is it. It's the end. Jesus is getting his shot. He has probably seen this happen time and time again. And he has always, these things have been burning and simmering in his heart. And he sees three problems. The first one is this, because this sacred space, which was supposed to be a house of worship and solemn prayer, a place where you come and solemnly reflect on your sin, on God's holiness, and what he has done to provide for your forgiveness. So this place that was supposed to be a place of worship and solemn prayer has become a noisy, bustling mall. It's a market. And Jesus says, this is not the way it is supposed to be. You're not supposed to be profiting profiting from enterprise in God's holy place. Number two, second problem. The money changers are likely adding an exorbitant percentage to their exchange rates in order to make a buck. So they're not supposed to, but clearly they are. Jesus is walking around and he's watching them add the percentage to their exchange rate so they can make some money during this week in which they really weren't making any money. So this infuriates him. And then lastly, thirdly, this provides the vendors the perfect opportunity to price gouge the out-of-towners. Where else are you going to get a sacrifice? You have to have these sacrifices in order to make the, make the sacrifice for your sins for the next year or to celebrate Passover or to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. You have to have these sacrifices according to Moses' prescription. Where else are you going to buy them? Well, this is a one-stop shop. You can get it all here. And so they see this sort of uh, raising of the rates on exchanges and the price gouging going on with among the vendors. And this is a picture of pure, corrupt religion, turning the sacred into big business. Now, I want to say two things. I want to say very clearly, Christian principles and truths and ethics and values can help you run your business better. All of you who own a business or run a business or manage a business, you know that if people act Christianly, it's just a better place to work, isn't it? There's no corruption. People are fair. You don't have a crummy boss who drives you crazy, makes you crazy, right? Hopefully, you're not that guy or gal. But Christian principles and values can greatly enhance your business. I want to say this. Sound and prudent business practices can greatly enhance your Christianity. Aren't you glad that we count our money accurately from the offering, the free will offering that we do every week? Aren't you glad this church is well-ordered and well-governed and well-run? 
Well, it's because we have some really smart people like Jay Sponestock and Vic and other guys who sit on the board and they're smart business guys. They know how to run things. And things are well-ordered. They are well-governed. Christian principles and values can greatly enhance your business. Prudent business practices can greatly enhance your ministry. But I want to say this very clearly. Christianity is not a business. The gospel is not a product that we're selling. And the church is not a place of commerce. How many of you bought a latte this morning? Not very many. Well, if you do, all the proceeds from that go to ministry. So we're not here as a for-profit. We're not profiteering off of the gospel. Why bring this up? This church doesn't do that, but why bring this up? Because we see it on Christian TV every single day, don't you? I mean, if, if you just flip the channels, you will see it. Somebody is always handing out a promise. If you give my ministry $100, you will get a hundredfold blessing. A thousand's coming back. <laughs> that is sinful. That is exactly the kind of religious corruption that Jesus is raging against right here. And so the telltale sign of corrupt and shady religion is any time the gospel becomes a product that churches sell or a ministry sells, or any time someone monetizes promises of the abundant life. And few things made Jesus angrier or aroused his fury, like watching corrupt religion turn the gospel, turn the truth, turn worship to God into a for-profit marketplace. And the Sanhedrin is complicit. They, either, they are either just winking at this, turning a blind eye to it, or they're running it. And he doesn't like it. Number two, Jesus confronted ingrown religion. Jesus confronted ingrown religion. We learn from Mark eleven seventeen. 17. He says, is it not written... My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, what is he quoting there? He is quoting Isaiah 56, 7. He's quoting that one line from Isaiah 56, 7, but I want to read you the context because what God is doing in Isaiah 56 is he's making the Jews jealous. They're idolaters, but they're still trying to worship with these sacrifices in the temple. And God is saying through Isaiah, I, I am going to go find me some people who worship in spirit and in truth. And God is inviting the nations. And God says, anyone who comes and worships me according to my protocols, according to what I have prescribed, they are my people. This is what he says to them. Look at it. In verse 6. He says, and foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to... And to be his servants, all who keep the Shabbat, the Sabbath, without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. And their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And the sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. What is God saying? This place is supposed to be a house of prayer so that the nations can come in and engage in worship to the one true God, Israel's God. And so the selling of cattle, sheep, doves, goats for ritual sacrifices used to take place down in the Kidron Valley. So as you go to Jerusalem, you go up on the top of Mount, the Mount of Olives, you look down in the Kidron Valley, and that's where all the kiosks and the vendors used to be. But Herod has moved them up to the outer court. What's the outer court? It's the Gentiles' court. So now the Gentiles' court is filled with merchants and vendors and kiosks selling these animals. Now you just stop and think what it would be like. Many, many uh, Gentiles were turning to the Jewish faith in the first century. There was a whole city full of them up in Antioch. Now just imagine you as a Gentile person. You have turned to the one true faith in the world. Uh, Israel's faith, right? You turn to Judaism. And you have gone through everything you need to do to convert. Think about how difficult that would be. You have to, as a man, you have to get circumcised. Okay, let's get real. And all your boys have to. Okay, and then you have to start eating a kosher diet, which was very difficult to abide by in the first century, especially if you didn't have a lot of money. It was hard. That was a hard uh, diet. 
And then not only that, but you have to observe these festivals according to Moses' law. You have to make the arduous trip, sometimes dangerous trip, and very costly trip. You have to bear the burden of the cost of travel and lodging and all the rest of it. And you make all of this pilgrimage down to the holy city. You come up on the Mount of Olives. You see no vendors down in the valley. And you come up into the one place where they say you can worship and you have no place to convene. You have no place to walk around reflectively in prayer over your sin. You can't worship because it's filled with sheep and cattle and noise and vendors. It's a mall. And so God says, and Jesus cries out, this was supposed to be a place, a house of prayer for the nation so that they could come here and worship Israel's God. But they can't. And so now... Uh, they are looking at the, the temple area and seeing all the Jews going into the temple area. And what's interesting about that is that they had erected, the Jews had erected uh, a partition wall and this partition wall kept them out. And there was a big stone inscription at every entrance through this partition wall and the inscription reads something like this. No Gentiles pass this point on pain of death. So what are you being told? What, are, what is all of this telling you? All of this is telling you, you're an outsider. You don't belong. We're the insiders. Sorry. You're second class Jews. Or you're second class believers. And, and folks, I think there's an application for us in here. We have to be careful. Our first priority as a church, our first mission, the first pillar in our mission is we gather disciples. We make disciples who gather for worship and to glorify God. That's, the, that's our number one calling. The second part of that calling is we grow those disciples in the word. We grow them in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the third is like it. The third pillar is very similar to it, and that is we go. We equip our disciples to go back out into the community and make more disciples. And the moment we stop thinking about visitors, and we stop thinking about the people who are new here, or stop thinking about the people who are, are outsiders, and we don't keep one eye, one part of our heart's eye on the folks who are not in our group. So we, we are not pleasing to Jesus. And so we have to be careful. Religion begins to fixate inwardly. And this is a very natural thing that happens to every church and every faith. It happens, it can happen to anyone, anywhere. We begin to just become naturally ingrown. And God wants us to look at the people who have made the effort to walk in the door and to sit in that chair and be handed a bulletin and get a tea or get a cup of coffee and hear God's word. We are to be welcoming to them. Number three, Jesus confronted routine religion. Verse 17. His disciples remembered. So while all this is going on, you can imagine the commotion. I mean, you could just imagine, this is a pretty large area. And so Jesus is apparently crying out loud enough for all of the vendors to hear him and all the merchants to hear him. And he has made a, a whip of cords and he is driving the cattle out of the door. So you can imagine the commotion, the chaos and John says, later on, we remembered that scripture in Psalm 69, which says, the zeal for your house has consumed me. Now, Pilate had an interesting way at the end of Jesus' life. He had a very interesting way of trying to uh, get Jesus off the hook. Why would bloodthirsty Pontius Pilate want Jesus off the hook? Why? Well, because Je no one, no Jewish leader ever had as many followers as Jesus. And if it turned out that Jesus from Nazareth was really a revolutionary, Pilate was in trouble. Now, secretly, we know in retrospect that guys like Pilate and other governors and prefects and even Roman emperors often communicated to one another by letter secretly that they were scared to death of mobs. They were scared to death of the masses rioting against them. And so you can imagine now Pilate is scared that Jesus might be a revolutionary and his, his followers, the tens of thousands of people who are listening to him and following him might revolt against Pilate. So he has a very creative solution. He puts two people before the, pe he puts two people before the crowds and they both represent a zeal tradition. 
not the same one. Uh, Barabbas, his name is Barabbas, and that is a title. Bar means son of, Abba is the word for father. So this is a man, a revolutionary, uh, who is a political dissident. This is a man who fancies himself as the true son of the father. But then you have Jesus of Nazareth, the son of God, who is the real son of God. And so Pilate puts these two men, apparently a very unsavory character, and this Jesus of Nazareth in whom he does not find any fault, and he thinks this is a no-brainer. Jesus will get off, and I don't have to worry about revolution. That's what he's thinking. But the Pharisees go around. They have such influence with the people. The Pharisees and scribes go around, and they influence the people to vote for Barabbas. And they cry out, yes, Barabbas. Now, both of them represent a zeal tradition in Israel. One is a political revolutionary zeal tradition, which Jesus constantly disavows. Jesus repudiated it from the Sermon on the Mount all the way to the end of his life. He's not there to take up the sword against Rome. But his zeal tradition is prophetic. Because in the Old Testament, the prophets of Israel, they were the ones who were zealous for the house and zealous for the Torah and zealous for the law. And this, we see a picture of this in Elijah. Elijah uh, is a picture of this in 1 Kings chapter 19. He says, oh Lord, I have been very zealous for Yahweh, my God. And then he goes on to say, but Israel has rejected your prophets. They rejected me. They rejected your sacred altar. And alas, I'm the last one. Have you ever felt like that? I mean, have you ever had a pity party like that? And you just thought, I'm, I must be the only good Christian person in this company. And God has to say to him, oh, suck it up, buttercup. You're not the last one. I have others. There's a remnant. But what Elijah is doing is Elijah is in this stream of tradition, a suffering servant. And Jesus is the last suffering servant in that line of suffering servants. He is the last persecuted prophet, and, and that is a zeal tradition. And so when the disciples think about this scripture, and it's found, I want to show it to you here in Psalm 69.9. This is zeal for your house will consume me. Notice this last part. And the insults of those who insult you fall upon me. Notice the context of that zeal. It's the persecution. It's the insults that fall upon me. And so the context of that psalm is the persecution of the psalmist. And so Jesus is in this line, and then you and I have inherited that calling, that zeal tradition. Romans 12, 11, Paul says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor hot. That's my translation. But keep your spiritual fervor as you serve the Lord. You and I are supposed to enthusiastically serve God And Jesus saw the very people who were presiding over sacred religion and then the people, the vendors, who were transacting sacred religion and he was infuriated. He was filled with zeal for the purity of God's house. And in the same way, you and I need to be zealous to safeguard the gospel. We need to enthusiastically safeguard the purity of God's gospel. And we need to be zealous to safeguard the unity of the body of Christ. We need to be just as zealous, just as enthusiastic enthusiastic about safeguarding our unity as a body as we are our sacred doctrines. And we need to be zealous to keep our mission central, our vision central. And so Jesus was a man consumed He was God's son, consumed with zeal for the purity of God's house. And number four, Jesus was confronting obsolete religion. This is this one is interesting. This is what really what the whole sermon is about. John two, eighteen through nineteen, and the Jews responded to him, What what sign could you show us to show to demonstrate that you have the authority to do this? You don't have the authority to come in here and clean out the Gentile courts and make room for the Gentiles. (laughs) You know, you don't have authority to do that. What sign could you give us? And Jesus answered them, I'll give you one. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The temple was constructed 400 years earlier under Zerubbabel, and then it was under a 40-plus year renovation project by Herod. And it was a gleaming, white, golden wonder in the ancient world. And Jesus is talking about tearing it down brick by brick, Or he commands them, he says, hey, you tear it down and I'll raise it back up. They didn't know what he was talking about. Of course they would have thought he was talking about the brick and mortar. 
But the disciples say, no, he was talking about himself. He was saying, you destroyed this temple, this body, and I will raise it again from the dead. Shockingly, Jesus claims something that no one would ever claim. And so the message of the passage is clear. God does not dwell, hear me well, God does not dwell in temples and buildings made by human hands. Acts 7, Acts 17. God does not dwell in consecrated space. That doesn't mean we don't consecrate space. We've consecrated this lovely gymnasium. (laughs) That's all it is. A bunch of cinder blocks. God doesn't live here. And you can build him a temple. He doesn't live there either. Because the God of the universe doesn't live in temples and houses made by human hands. He lives in the people of God. He lives in the people who are redeemed and born again and renewed in his presence. And so Jesus has come to tell them that all of your symbols, all of your structures are now fulfilled in the flesh and blood reality of God's only son. And now, as believers, you and I become the ever-expanding temple of God. I want to show you this. 2 Corinthians 6.16. Paul says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? What temple is he talking about? We are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and, and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. That has been God's project from the beginning. From the very beginning, what God has wanted to do is live and walk and be among us. Not not so that we would have to go to some sacred space, some sacred room where God's presence is manifest for one feast a year. No, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on you, on your life, on your family. And when we gather together, we are collectively the living temple of God. Ephesians 2, 20 and 22, he says, between Jew and Gentile, Jews and Gentiles are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. With Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in him, the whole building is is knit, it's joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So how did the New Testament apostles and the church interpret temple? Here's how they saw it. The tabernacle... And the temple in the Old Testament did two things. They pointed back to the garden sanctuary where God used to walk in the cool of the day in the garden with his image bearers. And then they simultaneously point forward to a time in which the new temple in Christ, all who are in Christ are now the dwelling of God among men. And so when you go out on your job and you go into your family and you go into your neighborhoods, you are the walking, talking temple of God. God is with you. God has filled you. And when we gather here in his name, his presence is poured out in our midst. So I have some questions for you. Just want to leave you with these. Question number one. What examples of dishonest and exploitative religion have you seen in the past? And how did it make you feel? How did it make you feel to see a little old lady give her entire social security check to some snake on TV. Did that, did that make you angry? Good. Because it should have, because that makes Jesus angry. Right? The church is not a business. We're a ministry. Number two, how can we check ourselves against the tendency to become too inwardly focused in terms of church life and community? How can we challenge ourselves to think outwardly and missionally in our community? How can we challenge ourselves to think about the people who are not here yet? To think about the people who are not part of this body and have not experienced the saving work of Jesus' grace. Does the heart of the church beat for the people who aren't a part of our group yet? Number three, what is John challenging us to do in order to maintain our personal excitement and zeal for God? How can we keep from our faith just becoming stale and routine? How do you do it? Can I tell you how I do it? Man, I just keep getting on my knees. I mean, I just, I just keep going into my office at home in the morning and sitting in my chair with my coffee and my Bible, the elixir of the gods and the word. <laughs> and man, I just sit there and let God's word penetrate my heart and nail me. 
And, and, I, and, and I walk out filled with the Spirit. And when I walk out filled with the Spirit, man, I am better than I walked in. So I just want to encourage you, do whatever it takes for you to do to become a personal worshiper of God. Let me ask you a question. Are you a passionate lover of God? For some of us guys, that's a hard thing to say, yes, I'm a passionate lover of God, because we don't talk like that. But that's what we need to become, zealous in our relationship for the Lord. Do you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord? Do we? Where are we at? Number three. Number four, what, uh, how does Christ make obsolete some of the learned religious behaviors we've grown up with? Some of the learned religious behaviors that we grew up with. Can I tell, I'll, I'll finish with this story. I was a little boy, I was probably seven years old, and I'm sitting in this little Southern Baptist church where I was raised, it was a church called Faith Baptist Church, and I was, I want to encourage you, you parents, um, no matter how bad you think your kid is, I was much worse than your kid. <laughs> much. I was the worst. And I hated church so much. Oh, my mom would drag me by the arm and I would be screaming, I'm never going to church when I grow up. I'm never going. (laughs) What irony. God is great. He has a sense of humor, right? So I get to church. This is one Sunday night. It was our evangelism service. Nobody ever got saved at that service. And so, um, so I'm sitting there, I'm sitting in the pews, tiny little church, probably 50, 60 people at the most. And they said, uh, you know, open your hymnal to page 79. So I was just kind of being funny and being cute. And I took the hymnal and I started flipping the pages real flippantly. I figured you liked that, Brendan. That's a pun. Sorry. Um, and I start flipping the pages really fast and I rip one of them. Whoosh. I mean, it just ripped and it was loud. And I won't tell you what her name was, but I remember this woman to the day I die. She was standing in front of me. She turned around. This is what she looked like. She went. (gasps) (laughs) I mean, she was horrified that I ripped this hymnal. And I put it back and I put it back in the thing. And I stood there and I was waiting for lightning to strike me. I thought God was coming down from heaven to get me. And later I told my mom and dad, I just said, I'm sorry I ripped the hymnal. That lady's going to get me. And my parents were like, so what? They'll get another hymnal. You know, and just what, what I discovered is that there were all kinds of little rules and little traditions and little things that had been elevated to sacral, to sacredness, right? And you and I, sometimes that's just human nature. We tend to make our traditions, we tend to ceremonialize them and commemorate them and make them equal to the word of God. But the question that this text raises for you and I is how can we confront those sacred cows? How can we barbecue them, Right? <laughs> Let's pray. God, we're so thankful. Oh, so thankful for your presence. We can't see you. We can't physically touch you, but we know you have poured the Holy Spirit out on us. You poured it out on us individually. You poured your Holy Spirit out on this gospel church. And God, we just pray right now that every single person who is in this room, if you don't know Jesus, you, have, you don't have a relationship with him. You've never made a commitment to him. You've never decided to follow God's savior, God's lamb, God's new temple. Would you just put your faith in him right now? Put your faith in him right now. You gotta use your own words. God, I trust in you. God, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe that you died on that cross and you rose again on the third day for my sins so that I would be saved and spend eternity with God. Would you receive it right now? Would you receive it right now? In Jesus' name, amen.